Welcome to the Susan Sly Project, where entrepreneurs rule, startups launch, and the side hustle becomes the main hustle. Ladies and gentlemen, your host, Susan Sly. All right, what's up, everyone? I just want to give you guys such an amazing shout out and shouts out to everyone listening in India. You guys have become the sixth largest listenership for the Susan Sly Project. I have a special guest today. Um, not only is she phenomenal, she has co-founded and run three seven-figure companies. Most people can't get to one, um, but she's done three. She, on top of it, is launching a new startup, which is called Light Pink and Investor Disclosure. I'm an investor in this company. I'm so excited about it for a variety of reasons. Uh, one being that um, I love alcoholic beverages. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Um, good reason. <laughs> yeah, it, it is a good reason, in, in my opinion. Um, the other thing that I want to share is that we, you know, really and truly have known each other. We've grown together. We started together. We first met in the network marketing industry. And you may have seen her on Strong Magazine, Oxygen Magazine, Instagram, with hundreds of thousands of followers. She has the, the blue check mark, which I know is something many of you are, are hoping and striving for. So my guest today is a best selling author, a keynote speaker. It, like, what are you not? A cover model, a, a, like just amazing human, a philanthropist. So Lori Harder, welcome to the show. <laughs> I'm so excited to be here. It's, you know, it's so crazy to hear those things like still to this day, because there was a long period of my life, Susan, where like none of that was going on. Like I did not do one of those things until I think I was 28 or 29. So I always like to share that because I think nowadays it's like, oh my God, people have so much pressure that, you know, my brother's 26 and he was just saying like, I don't know what I want to do. I'm like, you're not, you know, you have so much time, like, don't even worry about it. So yeah, it, it, it's pretty, it's pretty crazy what you can do, um, you know, in, in a 10 year period. And that's kind of how you got to look at it. Yeah, it's, it's crazy. I just had May Kowalski on the show and, and that show has had the most listeners, viewers write in because May has owned the, one of the top influencer brand agencies in the world for the last 10 years. So she was mm. one of the first people in the space. And the fastest growing influencer group is 60 plus. So like, you what? know, I, yeah, I'm serious. <laughs> and, and on TikTok, the, there are people 60 plus making incredible money as brand influencers because this growing demographic of people on social media, they want to pe see people just like them. So to your point, you got lots of time. I don't care if yeah. you're 20. I don't care if you're 65, you got tons of time. Lori, let's jump right in, you know, What's lighting your soul on fire right now? Oh man, Be, you know, as much as it's like painful and challenging, being super challenged with a new company that I have never done is lighting my soul on fire. And I, it, it's crazy because as much as I have always said, I've loved challenges. I've come to this place where I, I'm so self-aware that I need to, to almost feel like I won't be able to solve something in order for me to to really feel like accomplished and satisfied throughout the day. Um, and you know, there's lots of days where I'm like, what the heck am I doing? Like, why did I, why did I even start this? And there's days where I feel like I'm never going to find a certain answer that I need. Um, and that's the puzzle. I think that's the journey that we sign up for. So the more that I lean into that and I'm like, this is, this is what I love. Like this is learning something completely new or going into a territory that I really was like, I don't think that this is possible for me. And then coming out the other side of like, I can't believe I did that. That's what's lighting my soul on fire. It's just like these massive challenges, even though it's also what's frustrating me. <laughs> I feel like, that, I love that. I feel like for a lot of people, it, startups are like where say franchises were, you know, 50 years ago and mm. everyone wants to do a startup. Um, my um, Avery's boyfriend, Kieran, his younger brother, Colin was like at our house. And he's like, I want to do a tech startup. And he's 15. Mm. And as glamorous as it sounds, and we hear about the big Silicon Valley exits and, you know, that, you know, someone walks away with $500 million and yeah. the, the rate of failure in startups is so high. So you and I, um, both startup founders, uh, female founders, it's very low. And I want to give a statistic female led pitches to venture capitalists mm. have only a 2% acceptance rate over 98% for men. So wow. here you and I are, we're startup founders. Um, we've both made millions in the direct sales space, millions in other areas. And now we're foraging, not into only something 
we don't have a huge background and I'm a I've been doing this a little bit longer than you, but that as women, the success rate is very low. Mm -hmm. And, and I want to ask you have, you know, what in doing the startup, what is the biggest challenge you've encountered so far? Oh, I, I just have to just add to that too, before that question is just like, that's why we have to do it. Right. That motivates me so much. Um, biggest thing that I've encountered so far is I really notice, especially because I'm in a very male dominated, uh, category with, with alcohol, it's very much, um, Oh, I, I, I get on calls and it's kind of like, I'll, I get either the tone or someone who will kind of be like, do you even know what you're getting into? Kind of like, Oh, this is interesting. You're, you know, and they don't, it's kind of like, they don't even mean to be that way, but it's just historically been this way for so long that women are not in this category. And I don't have a background that they literally will say things like, you're, are you aware of what you're up against? And are you sure you want to take this on? And every single time someone says that, like the fire gets lit even more. Yeah. Um, because, you know, I know so many women who have, it's funny, the, one of my very first calls, Susan, I got on a call with a woman who had started um, an alcohol company kind of similar to mine. And she was about seven years in. And I said to her, what is one piece of advice that you would give me, you know, for where I'm at? And she said, don't start. <laughs> I literally was like, I was not expecting that at all. And she was like, I wouldn't start it. You're up against, you know, all of these men. And this is, she's like, it is not easy. It's been awful. And I, that was the moment where I had had a similar um, experience happen uh, where when I was writing my book, I had a really close friend who had just written a book and had done the whole like tour and the, you know, the, the whole shebang, like two yeah like as high as you could go with as much as you could do with the marketing and everything. And she said, I feel like as a really, like a friend of yours, I need to tell you not to do this. Like you should just maybe self-publish or, you know, is this something you really want to do? And she's like, I'm getting a, a hit, like a gut hit that I should tell you not to do it. And that was a moment when I checked in with my gut and it was like, nope, she actually just confirmed that you must do it. And so mm -hmm. when the woman told me, don't start the alcohol company, I asked myself in that moment, will you be able to continue to be happy or, or satisfied if you let this thing go? And my gut reaction was like, no, nope, this is even a bigger reason why you need to go and do this is because women who are getting into this category are feeling like, you know, they can't do it and they're being told they can't do it. And I think that's, you know, besides, and I'll tell you the second biggest challenge, but getting, just getting over that emotional, like, com like committing, knowing that, it might be really challenging and choosing that that's not going to be my story. I, all of the time, instead of like, you know, when I'm in a hard conversation or I kind of get like, you know, the little, the pat on the head from someone like, Oh, you're so cute that you're doing this. Um, it's that moment of just like digging deep and, and digging back in. And the second most challenging thing is just the, the licensing with this is like, nothing is actually clear in the alcohol industry. It's like it, you are working completely in the gray. And also while you're working in the gray, you're trying to make sure that you're doing everything, you know, as, it, 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 as legal as possible, but there's no lines. Like there's, you're just like kind of operating in this space of unknowing. And that's been and on top of not knowing. And then really having like the industry leaders being like, well, this is a gray area, but here's what this person does. And here's what this person does. So you decide. Um, that's been a huge challenge is just kind of like, okay, we're going to blaze this trail. And if it, we bump into a problem, you know, we're going to look at the problems that have occurred and then solve them when we get there. And mm -hmm. I think that's kind of what we're always doing, right? It's like, you're choosing the the best worst option. And I'm doing that a lot and knowing that when I get to a, a place where maybe there's another roadblock or whatever that is, nothing is ever a stopping point. Um, so I, that's the attitude I'm going in with of all of these things that are coming up is like, well, we're gonna make you know the, the best worst decision of whatever this looks like. And then we're gonna solve that problem uh, once we get there. The, it's that's incredible. And the, I love what, you know, it's so funny. I was thinking this and this has happened with you and I so often about the pat on the head and you yeah. said, and I'll walk into a room, a boardroom and it's all men and me. And in, in AI and tech, there aren't a lot of women. And I, what I find hilarious in, in whether it's influencer marketing or whether it's startup or whatever, that as a woman, a man can say the same thing. And everyone's like, yeah, 
And then, you know, as a woman, I got told once by, we were doing a pitch and afterward I got told by someone that we were pitching to, he said, I find women like you are always trying to prove themselves. Mm. And I was the one leading the pitch. And I was like, you freaking bastard, like how dare Mm. you, right? And so, you know, when we talk about that marginalization, I've experienced it. And one of the things that I found is, you know, now I'm, I'm three years into this and, and, you know, we've gone from a a pre-revenue startup to now, um, a $40 million valuation. And now, you know, in 2021, Mm. we'll be at a hundred million dollar plus valuation. And what I found for myself is that I, even though I perceive that I've got to be 30% better than if I was a different gender, I'm willing to do it. It's like you Mm. said, like if someone's telling me not to, if, if, you know, that challenge is there, I'm going to get better. Like in the face of challenge, give up or get better. Right. And, Mm -hmm. and I love that. So let's, some people are viewing listening. They're like, what alcohol company are you talking about? Let's, let's talk about that. Cause you and I know what we're talking about. So, so talk about light pink. What's the vision for it. Talk about the product. Oh, so light pink is a uh, wine. It's a light wine based rosé flavored seltzer. Um, And it really came out of all of the things that I have done before, kind of all meeting in one place. You know, I think looking back, we can all be like, whoa, why did I have that job? Or why did I go through this? Or why did I start that other company? And it's like, where all roads are meeting for me, where all roads are intersecting. And it gives me chills just to think about it because um, it, it also has an educational component. So where all roads are intersecting is everything I've ever done is about connecting women, like showing them that if you have this dream, you can go alone, but it's going to be slow and it's going to be hard and you may not get there. And when you, once you get there, you're going to be, you know, at your house or in your hotel room or wherever you are celebrating the thing that you just accomplished by yourself. There might be plenty of people on Instagram or Facebook saying congratulations, but it won't impact you because it's not those people who built it with you. So everything's been based on connection. And, you know, all of all of the things that I've done in the book that I wrote, I had this moment of, you know, I was asking these women to read this book on connection and why we have trouble with connection and then start this book club around this book to help them connect, except most mainstream women aren't really reading books or doing book clubs. So I wanted to really reach the masses. And so I sat down one day and I was like, where are they, like, where are they all connecting besides social media, which we know is not like real connection. And I was like, oh, they all think like girls nights, right? Like cocktails or whatever that is. There's always like connecting over wine or going out or meeting for a glass of wine. And I don't know about you, but I have left so many like networking events or girls wine nights where I'm like, oh my God, like I, I got either too drunk because I felt awkward and, <laughs> and I, I didn't really feel connected. And I was like, God, that's exa-. I usually leave saying that's exactly why I don't want to do those things is because mm. we didn't get anywhere. Like maybe, you know, you went with a group that the more wine you drank, the more people gossiped or the more they complained or whatever that looked like. And it's different for everyone, but I was like, what if I could elevate this um, experience of connecting over cocktails, even if it was just like one tiny moment where, you know, something in the conversation changed, like, what if I could change the conversation over connecting with cocktails? And so I also love to have cocktails. I love to have wine, except I don't love the way that I feel. And in order to be, you know, you know, Susan, like when you're starting to be really social and building a business and it's like, you kind of are like, wait, I don't want to be drinking, you know, two, three nights a week or, you know, every, every night on the weekend, is there something that's lighter that I could just have one that I could still feel great the next day to be really sharp for mm-hmm. what you need building and running yeah. a business. Um, so that's when I was like, what if I made like the most amazing tasting cocktail um, that was female funded, female founded, like screamed at you from the branding. Like this is for you. If you resonate with the hashtag boss babe at all, like something that was just so on brand for their life. And also if they looked into the company at all, like they knew what it was about and they felt this emotional connection to it because I did not feel emotionally connected to any cocktail I was drinking. I was just like grab something because it was, you know, maybe it was light or whatever. And all these seltzers that are coming out, no offense to anyone, but there's really 
not cute branding. Girls don't want to be seen with it really, you know, for the most part. Um, so I was like, wait, there's brands everywhere. And I'm so emotionally connected to certain brands that I use, but I'm not emotionally connected to any brands that I'm having cocktails with, like, or that I'm consuming. And, uh, it was just like a huge moment for me that there was, there was a bit of a white space with a new category with that, where we could elevate, we could connect, we could, get other women involved and also have an educational piece around why aren't we as women funding our dreams? Um, you know, I just had a conversation with somebody yesterday, a guy who has, um, he is an alcohol founder, really well known. Um, and he's raised uh, about $45 million throughout the span of his career with this um, company. And he told me out of the $45 million, he had one female investor at $25,000. And I literally had this moment where I was like, oh, oh girl, you got to run through a wall with this. Like this conversation has to change. And Susan, I have so many women who are like, how do I get to the next level? Like whether they're making six figures or they're at that seven figures, it's been really, I've been watching these female entrepreneurs who are working their asses off, like not able to get past like this either low seven figures or six figures. And I'm like, it's because we're not in the next conversation. We're not in the building a company conversation. We're not in the, how do we invest or become investors or get investors conversation? Like, I can't tell you the amount of women who are like, can you, is there some way that you could like teach me about this? Because I'm so interested in going to this next level. And like, this is not in my realm. And I just had this moment of like, wow, we aren't, we're not privy to this conversation unless, you know, thankfully I got into it because my husband was willing to teach me about investing. It was patient enough to sit down and be like, okay, this is what this means. And, you know, this is what we can do. And, and this is how you can get involved. And, and it was just this moment of like, wow, I, I don't run in that circle and um, wanting to get women involved in that. Yeah. It's a beautiful, it's a beautiful vision. And thank you, Lori, for, for sharing that. And, I love what you said about being connected to the brands, right? And mm -hmm. and how often as women, and we know it, it's a confessional, right? Like, and me too, it's like, I'll, uh, I'll come home and I'll have a glass of wine. And I sit there and I go, why am I having this wine, right? Mm -hmm. What is this doing for me? And I know for myself, my brain, I'm overseeing four companies right now. So yeah. I still have obviously my network marketing business um, and then co-founder of Radius. I own a digital agency and I have a, a startup consulting firm. Mm -hmm. And we have my business partner and I, we have very specific KPIs of, of startups we'll work with. And over the last few years, it's like my brain is going a million miles per hour because I'm thinking cap table. I'm thinking, you know, supply chain. I'm thinking all this stuff. And then sometimes yeah, I'll come home and I'll be like, I'm just going to sit after the kids go to bed, I'm going to have a glass of wine and I'm going to have that moment. And I, one of the things when we first started talking about light pink that I really appreciated was it's never for me, anything other than the sugar content that makes mm. me feel like crap the next day. Cause I yeah. can't do any sugar desserts, anything. And so, um, the other thing I really appreciate about like pink is that the box is an experience. Mm which is so cool. Like you open the box and it's, it, you can just feel your heart, your passion, the vision. I want to talk about for a moment, going back in time a little bit, because I think people will, who know us, and, and I know thousands of people will listen to this and know us that they, one of the things is how did we get here? Mm -hmm. Right. And you and I were talking before we went into recording about the, the network marketing and direct sales space. Yeah. And, and I would love for you to talk about that because we, you and I have no sacred cows. Um, what are the top things you learned from building a seven figure per year plus business in network marketing? And how are those things translating right now into what you're doing with your startup? Oh my gosh. I mean, the, it's hard to just like pinpoint a few because there's hundreds of things I've learned, if not thousands. Um, I would say that for me, I learned how to paint a vision for people really clear. Um, and that is like, I learned how to enroll people into a vision. And if you can do that, you 
kind of hold the keys to the universe um, and, and to become so certain in something. Like if you believe in something, your certainty will be what gets everyone on board and what keeps everything afloat and what keeps everything going. Mm-hmm. Um, and that, that was it for me. Like my level of certainty in the network marketing company that we were both in was so high because I had, I had seen the problem. I saw what it solved. And then I had my own experience. Um, it's kind of what's happening right now, right? Like I see the problem with light pink and where we need to solve a connection problem and an education problem. And it's like, it, once I learned how to get people enrolled and paint that picture, I mean, like I could get on the phone with just about anybody and get them enrolled in that vision. And that's when I learned how that worked and like how to prep myself before those calls and before I spoke to people to get back into my certainty and also to know what objections were coming. Like Mm. in that company, I got really, really clear on what objections were coming and then getting clear on what my answer would be for them. And that's kind of what I'm doing right now with light pink, right? Like I know the objections that are going to come with possible investors or it, you know, out in the world when I'm trying to get this out there. And it's just a game of getting the answers to those objections Um, and also when, when some people don't fall within being, you know, satisfied with the answer, knowing when to let them go. I mean, like, can we talk about that in, in network marketing that now applies to everything we do in life? Like know when your person is not your person walk Mm. away, like knowing when to walk away, whether it's someone in your company that you think that you need. Like I had so many moments in network marketing where like a a big person would come that I would think would be like a big business builder, but maybe they were kind of a jerk or a pain in the ass, or maybe they just didn't align with your energy. And, and I would watch people like spend the next six months, like trying to get people like this or get that person. I was like, I'm already on to like the next you know, thousand people (laughs) in in that six months. It's like, know when that energy is not aligned and never, ever, ever come from a place of need. If I feel myself needing like a certain investor right now, I'm like, this company is divinely, I believe, you know, I believe that our visions and our ideas that we get are truly from, they're from outside of us. They're from a source that is so much bigger than us. Um, you know, I, I, in my personal opinion, it's God. So it's like, when I get one of those ideas that give me, give me that moment of like so much, you know, when you first get an idea, Susan, where it's so much energy, like you feel like you could fly and you're like, this is it. You get full body goosebumps. You, you feel like if you were doing this thing that you're fully living into you, like it's just your life purpose. And sometimes that glimmer lasts for like 30 seconds, a minute, five minutes. Maybe we're lucky if we get it for an hour or something like that. If I get that, I truly believe that that is ours to take and run with. And if we give it as much, you know, support wings, everything that we possibly can, it will be successful. Even if it looks like a failure, it will be successful in terms of it'll bring you to the next idea. And for me, that's just always what I've gone with is like, no vision or dream requires certain people. It's supported on its own. And it will, if you support it in the best way possible and never come from a place of need, but always come from a place of supporting it, um, it will attract all of the right people who are meant for that vision. And that has saved me so many times because I, I learned because I was that person, right? Who I was like, no, we need this person. And you keep them on and all of a sudden, you're like having a lot of problems or your soul is being sucked dry, or there's a lot of drama within your, you know, your team or your employees or whatever that's translating to. And I think that's a huge recognition um, that will completely change your life. So those are some of the biggest things I've learned from network marketing. That's huge. And it's, it's so funny you mentioned that because every time we speak, it's always like that, that God drop, right? This mm-hmm. morning I was reading, I don't know, the 24th time, The Science of Getting Rich, Wallace D. Mm-hmm. Wells, written in the 30s. And the part I was on was where he was talking about how you aren't in an abundant mindset if you're trying to control people and mm-hmm. make them see your vision, just a paraphrase. And and in that network marketing piece, the, the thing I would say is that's fascinating to me is that people think, oh, well, I want to do a startup, but I'm just going to diss network marketing. 
Mm. It's a low cost way to get a PhD in business, because if you can get to multiple six figures a year, then you have the skills it takes to do something else and retain that income. And I'll just give you an example. So in in Radius, we brought in $7 million in seed money. And Mm. some of the, the people are like, raising money is hard. I'm like, raising money is not hard. Not if you have an abundant mindset. And to your point, if you can enroll people in a vision. So we did um, a one-to-many pitch. So we would just tell me if this sounds familiar. We'd set a date. We'd prepare the presentation. We'd invite like crazy. We decide who was pitching what part. The pitch would be about 20 minutes. Then we do Q and A. And we had a, like a closing rate of over 80% for these, right? And mm-hmm. in one one of the one to many pitches we did, we brought in a million dollars in 40 minutes, including the Q and A. Raising money is easy. In one of the startups I'm mentoring, they were like, raising money is hard. I'm like, nope. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to set the date. We're going to invite, invite, invite. Mm-hmm. We're going to know it's like a wedding. We'll have a bunch of people that say they're going to come. They don't show whatever. And then we're going to pitch. And, and it's understanding. And, and one of the very like infinite list of things I appreciate about you is you, this continuous abundant mindset, but mm-hmm. you know, I don't think anyone, there was a, a New York times bestselling author recently who, who dissed network marketing. I was really sad. She did it because 87% of the network marketing field are women. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and they're attorneys, they're physicians, they're smart women like you and I, you know, and, and, and don't be ever putting down an industry that mm-hmm. is from, like predominantly female dominated. Like, it's just crazy. I want to, what the, I want to ask you another quick question about network marketing. What do you say to the person who, who perhaps has a perception of it, that it's beneath them? Mm. Well, I, I mean, I can speak to this really clearly because I, I had that perception before network marketing because my parents had done it and then drilled into me that it doesn't work. So, mm. um, you know, and I, I saw a lot of um, just like our family annoyed with them. Um, just, it, just all the, I saw all the things, right? Because they didn't give it the try that it needed. And they also weren't you know, there is a somewhat of a natural ability to like get people enrolled and live your, be, be the brand and, and live your life that way. And I can look back and say that was not happening. Um, so I had that total like taste in my mouth of like, oh, this, it's just, it's kind of cheesy. Like it doesn't work. Like people think it's, you know, people are going to judge me. They're going to think X, Y, and Z of me. So that was actually really tough because I was building my in the beginning, I was building my career in fitness where your, your reputation was kind of everything. And it was also like, oh, if people do network marketing and you're in fitness, they're just trying to make money off you because they don't use those products anyway. Right. Like that was kind of like how it went. These girls, you're like, they don't use that crap. Like, look at them. So they, I was like, I can't do it because I'm never going to like the magazines won't let me in. If I say that I do this thing and they want you to promote their product, so it was actually a crazy point for me where I had to be like, do I choose my dream? Cause at the time my dream was to be like on fitness covers and, and uh, be like a fitness mentor, which at the time it was, there was no fa- like real Facebook at the time. There was no, I think maybe it had just started. There was my space or something. And so I had this, that, that moment of like, oh my God, you know, I don't think I can do this, but I also in my life, thank God, my, my back was so up against a wall. Chris and I had just, um, my husband had lost his job. It was 2007 in the recession and I was doing random jobs. Um, so I was only, you guys, I was on, only earning, like, I don't know. I, I was working in LA fitness, making $6 per 30 minute session, not paying the bills. Um, so, <laughs> you know, I could barely pay for, um, our cars, let alone anything else that we were doing. So, we had lost everything 2007. We were $300,000 in debt. We lost our home. We lost our cars. We borrowed money from his parents. We borrowed their whole retirement, still didn't even touch it. Um, so I was like, and my parents had gone bankrupt growing up. And I had a moment of like, this will never happen to me again. And I didn't view myself as someone who was super educated. I didn't feel like I had a lot of you know things that I could do. So at the time I was training someone who was doing network marketing and she had, she had shown me her paycheck. And I was like, okay, pride aside, doing this, just let's do it. Cause I tried the products. They were amazing. They had worked for me, but I still had like a lot of shame and fear around it. Cause I was trying to build this other, you know, um, dream. And I was like, you know what, 
I got to go for it. Like I can't live this way anymore. And this is a great product. And I've always been a person who's been able to share a product and people end up using it or doing it. So I knew that I had a little bit of influence. Um, so I was like, I'm just going to try it because I think it's also going to be awesome for my clients and some of my friends. Um, so uh, that's when I tried it and I started seeing the results and, um, you know, I committed though, I said, I'm just going to go all in on this and try to make X amount of dollars. So I made a goal. Um, I went back to the pain point a lot of like, sometimes I would, you know, people would say things. I definitely got a lot of people who called me a sellout. Um, you know, I had some magazines who didn't want to work with me and that was really challenging. Um, but at the same time, it was like, it doesn't matter if this magazine doesn't want to work with me. They're not paying crap anyway. I need to take care of myself. Like that was a moment of what if I cut out the middleman and don't worry as much about getting on these magazines, but actually worry about making the income where I can decide what I want to do. And I don't need these people to approve of me. And I can get a bunch of women who are on board with not needing people to approve and all of us deciding to cut out the middleman and doing our own thing. I'll make my own damn magazine if I want to. Like that is what I started to get into. Cause I was like, this is working. And this is like such a great way for all of us to make money. And as much as I loved the body transformation as a personal trainer, like helping women with their body, I got to this place that I was like, okay, if they're not confident and if they're not making money and they don't have the money to be able to change their body, their situation, the food that they're eating, the environment that they're in, like I'm not doing anything. So I, not a, on top of that, I was like, wait, a financial transformation is actually more power than an initial physical transformation because that will take away the stress and give them the time to actually start getting their health in order. So for me, that was that moment of just like, get over yourself. Ego is your greatest overhead at all times. If you can get over yourself and like just do the do, you will be wildly successful. And Chris and I still to this day take that lesson when we're doing something that we're just like, oh my God, get get over yourself and just do the work. And if, if you can see like what the outcome could possibly be, you need to get out, out of your own way. I, I, there's a, there's a, one of my favorite sayings is if your ego is bigger than your bank account, you know, <laughs> right. And that's so and, good. You know, it's like, you can't have an ego bigger than your mm -hmm. bank. Account. Like, mm -hmm. it, and that's the, the thing I know that, you know, I've been prejudged and discriminated against, uh, many times because of network marketing. And I had someone say to me, well, you can't let anyone know about your network marketing background because in Silicon Valley, no one's going to take you seriously. Well, the hilarious thing is over 50% of the, the money we raised um, for Radius came from network marketers. Mm. Yep. And, and that's the whole point. It's like you, you go in, there is, in my humble opinion, you can go and do an MBA, you can spend $250,000 doing that, or you can invest, you know, 250, 500 bucks, get coachable, go grind it out and get your mm -hmm. PhD in business and go yep. back and get your MBA and pay for it in cash. If that's what's on your heart to do, but like it's, it's, it's a training ground. You're going to face everything. And if you can go through that, it's like Navy SEAL boot camp, then you can go and do something else. And you're, you're going to be much more likely to be successful. Um, so thank you for your, your wisdom on that. I want, you know, people, you know, are like, oh my gosh. So Lori, you have all these balls in the air. So what does your day look like? <laughs> oh my God. It's always different, uh, especially right now, because I'm solving a whole lot of problems that I, um, you know, I didn't even know that I had <laughs> starting this. So I guess every day is kind of looking at, you know, like on the weekend, I'll look at what the next week is going to be. And it's like, what is top plate right now? Like what will move the business forward the most while simultaneously making sure that I'm taking care of things that will need to, to happen down the road. Like, um, you know, right now top plate is getting investors um, involved, like closing out this round. So for me today, like just today, we're sitting and we're going through um, all of my spreadsheets, super sexy stuff, you guys. Like I'm going through all my spreadsheets of people who have gotten the product, people who were once really interested, um, you know, people who, who told me to circle back and we're circling back again, because with a raise, it's kind of like, you have to think of it as, you know, so many people said they're interested or that they want to invest, but it's not their top priority right now in their life to be like, 
yeah, let me just go to the bank because you have to go there physically to wire the cash and then fill out paperwork. Like, or you know, they're if I, sorry to cut you off or I didn't go to the bank physically, but you know, out of one of my accounts, it was like, yeah, no problem. And, but I had to go through, like I kept going and then my bank account got shut down because there were yeah. like the wiring and, and I just want to just, just interject. Sorry. I never cut a guest no, off, but I want to just throw that out there because to emphasize what Lori is saying, this in a startup, a lot of people are like, yes, I'm in. And then you're, you're chasing them. Right. And I was mm -hmm. saying to Lori, before we went into this, um, one of my business partners is the ultimate chaser. And so we, we like, because it's, I don't care what it is, what kind of business you're in, you're going to have so many people who are like, yes, I'm in. And then suddenly when it comes to money, that's a whole other come mm -hmm. from. So I wanted to say that because that is like a full-time job right there. So sorry, it's, keep going. It's totally, no, I'm so glad that you said that just because it's, it's the barrier of entry for them. You're asking already busy, most likely successful people to go and take like a full on afternoon to go figure out paperwork in the wire and getting that money to, to you. And it's kind of like with no immediate payoff for them, right? Like if they're usually doing this, they're like getting a car after or a house or an RV or something. And you're like, yeah, could you do this massive investment? And then, you know, just I'll talk to you in, you know, three or five years. <laughs> yep. So it's not like a big motivation. So you have to just like network marketing, you have to like follow up, follow up, follow up, follow up. So that's been really powerful for me is knowing that the follow-up, like they say sometimes like seven or eight times, like knowing the art of how to do a follow-up with some urgency. Um, you know, you have your one or two nudges that are just like, Hey, like the excited one. Then you have, you know, your other one that you have to create your own urgency. And sometimes that looks like, Hey, you know, I just put a date on the round when I'm really looking to aim for closing. Um, you have to close your investors because they want to do it. They just need that extra push to be like, crap, if I really want to be involved in this, I got to get out there. Um, so that's what my days are looking like right now on top of, you know, like podcasting and keeping some other things going. Um, but there are some things like I had to let go of some really good things. Like one of my one of the businesses that you had mentioned, I let go of, of one of my membership sites that was still making a ton of money um, because energetically I did not have the bandwidth for it and I felt it. Like, so I had to let go of something good in order to make room for the great. So I let go of actually a lot of income right now um, because I don't have the time for it um, and I'm going all in. And, um, you know, I, I know that if I want this company to be what it's supposed to be, I have to go all in on it. And that requires me to create space. Um, so yeah, th that's what my days looks, looks like right now is just a lot of um, making sure I'm supporting it through fundraising, um, also projecting out like for launch, who do I need? What do I need? So we're already talking about like our hires, hire, our, you know, our hires for marketing. So I have somebody helping me with that. Um, and just a projection of like, what will the investors be helping me with, with launch? Um, I'm talking to a lot of co-packers right now. It's different, Susan, it's different every day. Yeah. <laughs> it is. I think that the biggest thing is I, whatever business someone is in watching or listening, 80% of Lori's day, just so everyone is clear is in follow-up. And I love mm -hmm. and, and appreciate so deeply what you said, like you let go of things that you loved to make room and space for this. And, and with Radius um, two years ago, first I came in as a vice president, then I was the president, then I became the co-CEO last year. A CEO of a tech company, we have to give people perspective, we have employees in Phoenix, Silicon Valley, mm. Europe, and we have um, employees in India. When I, you know, I just got a, I, my day starts like at four in the morning at 6am, I start to get texts. Like I got one this morning. Hey, there's a $90 billion opportunity. I need you in a meeting on Friday morning. Uh, yes. Like it doesn't mean we'll get 90 billion, but to be part of a bid for stuff like right. that. And a lot of the stuff we might pitch might be a no for now, yes for later. Like it's just constant, but my day is very similar. It's pitching and following up, pitching and following up. And I had to... I had to clear space out of things that were generating significant amounts of revenue because this is like you, you do, you go all in. And that's why startups are not for everyone. I just mm -hmm. had Emily Hookman on the show. Emily is top Forbes 30 under 30. I'll introduce you to her. You'll love mm -hmm. her. So for your show and, 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 you know, she, she founded Wellery, an anti-diet app. 
and she yeah. got like two million dollars in funding right away and now she's the of course has to be accountable not just to her team but to all of those investors mm -hmm. and and people don't understand that once you start a startup and you have investors they want updates right mm -hmm. then then like you said you might not see an roi three to five years sometimes seven to ten and there's just there's so much and it's it's these are 16 hour days like mm -hmm. that's that's why we're all going to be drinking light pink every night um <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah um i'll take a pallet please like yeah. <laughs> could you send a pallet <laughs> yeah um final question let's talk about this super quick so um light pink is gonna launch um and let's talk about the the launch dates when people should start to look you all want to be following at Lori Harder on Instagram, follow me. You're probably following me at Susan Sly on Instagram because we're going to be doing, you know, a lot of talking about this. But let's talk about the launch. When's it launching? How are people going to be able to buy it? Yes, um, it's going to be launching late spring, so right on time for summer. Um, and you can buy it online. So our first year is going to be all online. So uh, we're hoping to be in 43 to 47 states at that point. Um, but definitely should launch in main states right away. Um, and then you should be able to get that like direct to consumer online. Hopefully it's like a two, two to three day turnaround is what we're aiming for to get it to your doorstep, which is super awesome. Cause we know when we want, you know, alcohol, we want it now. <laughs> yeah. So you can, and you can ship it to your friends as well, which is really cool. And also do some auto ship things that we are going to be looking, um, at. So some other things, Susan, that we're thinking about is just some, um, you know, some educational components that might go with that, like auto ship membership, which you and I are very familiar with. So I love that. I love that brand model of, of, you know, an auto shipper membership. Yeah. And that was something actually mainstream business borrowed from the network marketing space. And, mm -hmm. and if we need to Lori, like I'm at my office in Scottsdale right now. So, um, I have a whole conference room. We'll just fill it with light pink and yes. we'll make it the distribution center. So if <laughs> Scottsdale. Well, Lori and I can have like a, like, you know, a socially distance, safe distribution of light pink. Yeah. <laughs> it's going to be great. It's going to be great. Surprise, you're now also a distribution center. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, anyway, Lori, we'll have to have part two, especially as we go to launch. Um, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for everything you're doing in the world. And, um, I, you know, I think the biggest thing landing on me right now, what you said is about, you know, really what you give up in order to give up the good to get to the great, you know, and that's, that's at some point, whatever business anyone is in, there is going to be that, but, you know, Lori doesn't ever give up time with Chris, her puppy, getting her workout in. We're not talking about, Lori and I aren't talking about giving up those things, but mm -hmm. there are a lot of things, whether it's Netflix, whether it's um, other things in your life that are you know, bleeding you emotionally dry, that if you're going to be successful, that it's not a sacrifice, friends, it's a privilege. So Lori, anything mm -hmm. final words you want to say? Oh, I just want to say thank you. Because if you guys don't know, like you were such a role model for me when I got into network marketing of, of just like what a very, you know, powerful yet, you know, loving person, woman in business could be. And you, you'd always also just like you were so savvy and smart and so many other things as well on top of network marketing. And, and I think that that was just something that for me was just a really beautiful model of, of, you know, what I could embody. So I just want to say like, thank you so much. And thank you for having me on your show. And I'm so excited for all of the things that we have um, coming up and just, uh, so cool that you are impacting so many people in this way. Well, thank you so much. I truly appreciate that. And, and it's been fun. Yeah. I can't believe we've known each other now almost 14 years oh and that we get to collaborate in this way. Mm -hmm. I'm so excited and fired up. Well, Thank you, Lori, so much for being here. Guys, if this show has been helpful, amazing, Lori and I on Spotify, iTunes, would love a five-star review. Share it on social. If you're on YouTube, I'm actually the one who responds to all your comments, not an EA, it's me. So just be nice, be a good human. That's all we ask. And hit the subscribe button and the like button. So thanks, Lori, for being here. Thanks, everyone. If, and uh, I look forward to seeing you on a future episode of the Students Live Project. Ladies and gentlemen, this has been another epic episode of the Susan Slot Project. For more tips, strategies, and ideas, visit www.susansly.com.